Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. I hope you've had a beautiful and meaningful Christmas weekend. It was great to have so many of you join us for Christmas Eve online or in person, and we're glad that you're with us today. We thought this Sunday after Christmas would be a great opportunity to come together as one church across all our campuses to celebrate Christ's birth. So welcome to all of you from Foxborough and Watertown and Wilmington and Lexington and East Lexington and Amherst, New Hampshire and our online community. We're glad you're here. Now, maybe you're traveling this weekend. Maybe you have friends or family with you for the holiday. Maybe you're on your own at home. Wherever you are, whoever you're with, whatever you're wearing, we're glad you're here and glad we can be together. And by the way, this is not a pajama shirt, okay? It's just the most Christmassy thing that I had. So, hey, if you're new to us, maybe you found us during the Christmas season, we'd love to make a personal connection with you. So you can text the word hello to the number there on the screen below. Just let us know you're here. We'd love to send you whatever information you might be looking for and a, a coupon for a cup of Christmas coffee on us. Well, first of all, a great big thank you to everyone who volunteered for one of our Christmas Eve services. Greeters, musicians, technicians, childcare workers, prayer partners. Uh, COVID continues to present us with challenges, but we are so grateful that we've been able to press through and find ways to connect and celebrate and share God's love with each other and the world. And thanks too for all of you who have been faithfully giving throughout the year to support the ministry and to bless the world. This is the final Sunday of the calendar year and, and a really important week for us to catch up on our giving. So we'll invite you to give in whatever way works best for you, online or through the mail or even dropping off your end of the year gift at the church office if that's helpful. We have a great service planned for today. We're gonna to continue singing some of the great songs we can only sing this time of year. Uh, we know we have some kiddos watching, so we have some fun kid moments in the service. And then Pastor John Kim will bring the next message in our loved series. Uh, which I, I think we've all found really meaningful. So let's pray as we get our service started. Dear Lord, we thank you again for the great news we get to celebrate this time of year. Thank you for the beauty of the songs and the stories and the message that we are loved. We pray, Lord, for every person we might have reached in this season, that they would know how very much you love them they would continue to take their steps on their journey towards discovering life with you. We pray for those of us who are able to gather and celebrate with friends and family, with gifts. May we recognize you as the giver of all those good gifts. And may we be faithful and generous stewards of those gifts as we share them with the world. And we pray for those of us who may be struggling this weekend, feeling alone or far from home, dealing with health or financial challenges, maybe family strife. May each one know that you came into the world to be with us, to be with them, even in our pain and heartache. May they know your comfort and provision this Christmas and the knowledge that they are loved no matter what. We pray now that you might meet us in the next few moments as we gather and worship as one community of faith spread out across greater Boston and beyond May we know that we are seen and chosen, that we belong, that we are free to love others as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was, what does that word say? He was a good and godly man. He was waiting for God's promise to Israel to come true. The Holy Spirit was with him. The Spirit had told Simeon that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. The Spirit led him into the temple courtyard. Then Jesus' parents brought the child in. They came to do for him what the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And said, Serve the Lord as 
You're going too fast, dog. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child for father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce through your own soul too. How do you think Simeon felt when he saw Jesus after waiting for so long? Like, he was like, I thought it wouldn't happen, but it did. Overjoyed, he felt like his life was accomplished. He's probably really happy. I think he was rejoiced because God's promise to him was fulfilled. How does it feel when Christmas is finally here? I get really excited. Happy? It feels really exciting and sometimes I feel like bouncing off the walls. Oh yes! Christmas is finally here! I just... Ugh. What does it feel like after Christmas has passed? Uh, good. Oh, yes! Wait, something I wanted. Sometimes you're like, oh, it's over. And then you're like, you just realize it's over and you're like, oh. And you might feel like energy has just rushed out of your body.
And the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands. So I will always sing when your love came down. And I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever, yeah. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free I'm happy to be in the truth And I will daily lift my hands Cause I will always sing When your love came down I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever could sing of your love forever. And 
Though I feel like dancing, dancing yeah. It's foolishness I know I know When the world is seen the light There will dance with joy Was the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. This book is one of the many about the beauty of the night before Christmas, the magical night St. Nicholas goes about his business. But I also know for some of us, the holidays is a difficult time and Christmas doesn't just make everything magically fine. But there is an excitement of unopened presents, the joy of friends and family's presence, for students looking forward to a week off from school, for adults looking forward to a vacation by a pool. The day of Christmas is magical too, waking up early to open gifts brand new. There's snow, lights, trees, Elf and Home Alone on the TV. But what about the day after Christmas? There's not many books about the magic of the day after Christmas. But if I may, here's what it might say. Twas the day after Christmas when all through the house, every creature was tired, even the mouse. The stockings were flung on the floor with no care and sadness that St. Nicholas was no longer there. So what you just heard is my own rendition of this poem called Twas the Night Before Christmas. And I've titled my own version, Twas the Day After Christmas, because I was trying to envision what a poem about the day after Christmas would be about. Because it has always dawned on me that the holiday spirit dies pretty quickly moments after Christmas is over. You know, for me as someone who grew up in Korean churches, my Christmas typically involved going to church in the morning, and then going into Chinatown for lunch, because if you don't know, Asian restaurants are the only places that op actually open on Christmas. So I don't actually really embody the traditional American Christmas spirit, but even for someone like me, who isn't really much of a Christmas person, even I have to admit there's something exciting about the holiday season. But the reason I especially love the holiday season is because people seem to be more loving, generous, and kind during the holidays. Statistics actually back that up too. So statistics actually show that about 30% of all donations for nonprofits come during the month of December alone. And there's a 5% increase of adult volunteers and nonprofits between Thanksgiving and Christmas compared to the rest of the year. And I don't need statistics to show me that kids usually try to be on their best behavior the weeks leading up to Christmas, am I right? <laughs> but that holiday spirit dies pretty quickly moments after Christmas is over. You know, think about it for a second, even for the kids that were sharing earlier about how they're still excited the day after Christmas, it doesn't take long for those new toys to feel like old toys. For adults, it doesn't take long for that holiday spirit of giving and loving to get packed away until next year like our trees and our lights. But the desire to give and love and care for others isn't supposed to be seasonal. It's not supposed to be dependent on seeing the first Starbucks holiday cup or listening to that first Moriah Carey song. 
The desire to love and care for others is supposed to be a lifestyle that comes from responding to this beautiful story of a child that was born in a manger. Jesus calls us to be people who love others, not just in the extraordinary moments like Christmas, but also in the everyday, in the mundane and ordinary moments of life. So today, on this day after Christmas, we're going to look at a story in scripture which comes from a seemingly ordinary moment in the days after the birth of Jesus. And we're going to learn what it looks like to not have Christmas in our rearview mirrors, but to respond to the story of Christmas with a love for others that extends into our daily lives. And that's because loving others isn't a seasonal activity. It's an everyday response to the sacrificial love of Jesus. Let's read from Luke chapter 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. So we read here about a moment days after the birth of Jesus, after the shepherds and the wise men were long gone, where Mary and Joseph were now back to doing the regular tasks parents did back in their time. And one of the things parents uh, would do first is they would show up at the temple for certain rituals. So seven days after birth, Jesus was circumcised, and 33 days after circumcision, they were back at the temple for the purification ceremony and the presentation of Jesus to the Lord. But in the middle of this ordinary task, when they got to the temple, there was someone who had been waiting to meet Jesus, and his name was Simeon. And we learn that the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so with that promise in mind, he waited for God to answer that promise. Some scholars seem to suggest that he could have very well been showing up to the temple every day for months or years, looking for the promised son of David who was going to save and deliver his people. And I love the way Simeon just waits patiently for God to answer his promise. Because I wonder if some of us are in a similar season where we feel like we've been waiting for God to answer a prayer. I wonder if some of us are going through an incredibly confusing and challenging season of life that just feels like it'll never end. And you're asking yourself, God, how much longer do I have to wait? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, Simeon didn't know how long he needed to wait either. But like he did for Simeon, God sometimes answers our prayers in unexpected moments when we least expect it. Uh, There was a point in my relationship with my now wife, but then girlfriend, that we knew we wanted to get married, but I had a huge problem. I had no money for an engagement ring, let alone a wedding. So uh, part of the problem was I had just gotten back from a six-month mission trip where I had spent all my money and I had no job and I also didn't own own anything because my parents, for some reason, gave my car away to someone while I was away. That's, that's a separate story. But I remember asking God in the moment, like, hey, God, like, what do I do here? I'd love to, to propose and get married, but I'm struggling financially. What do I do? And I felt like God was telling me in the moment to wait and trust him. A few months later, uh, after I kind of even forgotten about that time when I was trying to speak to God, on a random Thursday, I went to check my mail in my school mailbox. And in the mail, I see an envelope. And I open up this envelope, but inside is this check for exactly the amount of money I needed for a ring. I was so confused because it didn't even say who it was from and why I was given it, but it did have my name on it. My friends were like, hey, John, cash that in just in case it was an accident. (laughs) And just to be very sure and very clear, I'm not saying that God is some ATM machine where we go to for money and resources and things that we need and he just gives it to us. That is not true. But what I am saying is that God sometimes answers when we least expect it, when we're not even thinking about it. Because sometimes I think we get under the impression that God is available only during Christmas and Easter and sometimes on Sundays. But he answers us in these unexpected, not extravagant moments. Just like how Christmas isn't the only time we ought to love others, Christmas isn't the only time God hears us and answers us. The other two things we learn about Simeon is that he was righteous and devout. 
Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. That's what scripture says. And righteous in this context literally means that he was well behaved towards people. He loved his neighbor as well. And devout was talking about his love towards God. And if you notice, it says Simeon was righteous and devout. It wasn't loving neighbors or loving God. There wasn't an or in the equation, which I feel like is the way some of us operate. There was a time when my doctor was worried about something about my physical health. And he was like, hey, John, I'm going to need you to exercise and eat more foods with fiber. And in my mind, I'm like, hold up, doctor, I can't do both of those things at the same time. Best I can give you is a little bit of a rotation system. And sometimes we bargain with God. Hey, God, I don't know if I have time to worship and serve others. Best I can do is kind of like this rotational system. But what we do in the church isn't supposed to just remain in the church. A pastor, Darius Daniels, puts it this way. In the church, uh, we get to sing of God's greatness. But in the, wor- uh, in the church, we get to sing of God's greatness. But in the world, we get to demonstrate God's greatness. In the church, we get to talk about God's love. In the world, we get to display God's love. In the church, we get to verbally proclaim the gospel. In the earth, we get to visibly demonstrate the gospel. For Simeon, loving others wasn't a seasonal activity. It wasn't something he did when he had the time. We know that because Simeon didn't show up to the temple that day because he heard the Messiah was coming that day. He was already showing up, waiting, because he trusted in the promises of God. So when the Bible describes Simeon as devout and righteous, it wasn't because he loved God and loved others when the Christmas spirit got him in the mood. He loved people in the daily non-extravagant moments because of his love for God. He loved others in that time period between waking up and getting your first coffee. He loved others when the worker messed up on that Chipotle order that you wanted. His love wasn't seasonal or dependent on his mood. And after Simeon meets Jesus, he immediately takes him into his arms and begins praising God. And here we learn who we are called to love. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Did you catch who God is calling us to love? Simeon is a Jew, but he recognized that Jesus brought with him salvation, not just for him and his people, but for all nations, both Jews and Gentiles. For Simeon, it wasn't just about Jesus coming for him and his people, the Israelites. It was also for the Gentiles who were not like him. Simeon is actually one of the first people in the entire New Testament to recognize that the promises of God were for everyone and to recognize how wide and how deep the love of Jesus was. So Simeon teaches us that the story of Christmas isn't just about me and how Jesus loves me, which is important, but also how Jesus loves people who are not like me and specifically the person who was racially, ethnically, and culturally different from me. And I can't help but think back as this year comes to a close to the racial injustice issues that have been brought into light this past year and the reality of how much work there is to be done as people and as a church to fight for racial justice and to live out the heart of God that Simeon shows us in this passage. And some people might say, John, haven't we talked about race enough this year in the church? And to that I say, how can we stop talking about it when the word of God continually brings it up? The idea of loving others who might not be like us is integral to the heart of God. And time and time again, Jesus reminds us through scripture that our love isn't limited to friends and to people who look like us. It extends to people we might consider strangers or foreigners. I love the way Luke puts it. He says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If we love those who look like us, talk like us, think like us, what credit is that to us? Anyone can do that. But can we love people that we might not totally understand? Can we love people that don't agree with your cultural norms? Can we see that the love of God extends to all nations and not just our own? 
In this last section uh, of our story today, Simeon turns to Mary and gives her this prophecy about Jesus. Here's what it says. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon turns to Mary and says, this child Jesus is going to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. So the story of Christmas, Jesus being born into this world, enduring suffering and pain and dying on the cross for the sins of humanity is going to elicit one of two reactions, he says. Some are going to hear it and they're going to receive it. And some are going to hear it and some are going to reject it. And it's not to guilt us or anything, but it's just, this is the question that I have for us today on this day after Christmas. How are we going to respond to the Christmas story this year? Are we going to pack away our love for others until next year's holidays or when something good happens? Or are we going to respond to the Christmas story with an everyday love for others? And just to clarify, love in scripture isn't just about doing nice things for people, although that's definitely a really good thing to do. But Jesus really shows us what love is in 1 John chapter 3, 16 and 4, 19. It says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We love because he first loved us. Scripture tells us here that love is laying down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And one of the reasons the story of Jesus is so beautiful is because He doesn't demand us to lay down our lives for others. He doesn't say we're supposed to muster up the strength to love others because loving others is really hard. It's hard to love others when we're exhausted or when we've been disappointed or just when we don't feel like it. So when it's hard to love others, it's not about trying harder to love. It's about reflecting on the love that you've been given by Jesus. As a dad of an almost two-year-old now, my wife and I experienced our first temper tantrum as parents a few months ago. And it lasted a while, and it was in public right in front of Target where everyone was looking at us, and she was sick. And it was really a difficult moment for us to deal with in, in that time. But I was thinking about how it would be so difficult if I just thought to myself, you know, this is what parents do now, I guess. You just have to grit your teeth and deal with temper tantrums which is true to a certain extent, I guess. But what I did was I thought back to all the people in my life, my parents, my aunts and uncles, my family members, friends who had to deal with my temper tantrums when I was young, which I know from stories were pretty explosive, but they still loved me and cared for me. And as I think back to those things, that's what fuels me to love my daughter in those difficult moments when she has those temper tantrums too. When Jesus was born to this world in that manger, Jesus gave up his power and glory and honor that he was due as the God of the universe to come into this world as a little baby. And when we look to Jesus, and when we look back to the Christmas story, Jesus is inviting us to love sacrificially just as he did, giving up power, honor, and glory for the sake of others. And it is so important, especially in these difficult moments, that we love each other sacrificially and daily. Because, you know, I, was, I just read this beautiful quote from an author that says, Everyone you meet is fighting a battle you know nothing about. Be kind always. You know, every person we come across is probably going through a tough situation in life that we just don't know about. Maybe you're that person going through something that no one knows about. And we all know how valuable it is to be loved and cared for in those difficult situations in life. So God is calling us to bring that joy, love, comfort, encouragement to those people around us. So practically, there's two things I think that might help us um, to be people who don't just love seasonally, but love in response to the sacrificial love of Jesus. The first is by spending time with Jesus. That's how we look back, right? Whether that's in prayer, reading scripture, re-listening to to sermons, praising, lamenting. That's how we remember Jesus. The second, um, I think, just the practical thing is, 
is by waking up every morning and asking ourselves these two questions. Who can I love today? And how can I love that person today? Maybe that's the question you ask each other in the house before the school or work day. Maybe it's the question that you journal in the mornings when you wake up. But these two questions can help guide our hearts on a daily basis to be thinking about how we can be loving others. And you might be saying, man, this sounds so overwhelming. How am I supposed to be loving people every single day? And, and I agree, that, that does sound like a lot. And it can sound like, like a lot in the moment. But uh, soon you're going to hear uh, from my friend James, uh, who is someone who asked himself that very question. How do I love others daily? And when he asked God that question, God spoke to him really powerfully and meaningfully. And he now runs a company and he works, um, his daily job is specializing in using his gifts and music and technology to put a smile on the face of children and families who are going through cancer. And he has really given his whole life to the cause of loving others. So I've invited him to share his story to help inspire us to see what a life of loving others could look like. Here's the short little video that James has made for us. Hello, everyone. My name is James Arrigo, uh, and it's so good to get to virtually be here with you all. I just give give you a little bit of background about who I am and what I do. To boil it down, I, I help kids who are battling uh, cancer to dream big. Um, so my wife and I, we, we run this program together. We created it, and we work with kids and teens from all over the world now uh, and helping them create their own cartoon music videos and animations and video games and all this stuff that's specific to what they you know can dream up and we find ways to do that with a team of people from all over the world so uh, it's just incredibly beautiful uh, the, the work that's been happening and how God has led all this into fruition the main reason why I, I do this it's it's to serve as a positive distraction for for the patients while they're getting their treatments but um, more importantly, it's a way to preserve their voice and their legacy um, in, a, in a fun and beautiful way. You know, when I was in high school, I don't know how many other uh, folks are like this, but when you were in school, you know, I just felt like I was kind of going through the motions. I wanted to use my life to help people. And I didn't necessarily know how to do that um, or what I was supposed to do to do that. Um, and so when I was feeling that way and feeling in that rut, I just, I remember specifically one night I was just laying there in bed saying my nightly prayers. And I just said, you know, dear Lord, please, you know, use my life to help people. And literally the next day I got these two severe hits to the head during a lacrosse game. And they were so bad that it, it you know, it, it led to a whole long road of recovery. It took about two and a half years to get back to normal. I had difficulty reading, writing, talking. I was thinking, you know, I was like, okay, Lord, like, I don't know. I could have gone without the two hits to the head. Um, but you know, how are you using this to, you know, for me to be able to use it to help other people. You know, fast forward today, I, I help kids who are, and teenagers from all over the world now um, create their own songs and silly songs uh, over and over and over again. And it's like, it's almost like now this, that brain injury was like my little superhero power um, and made me more of an expert at what I do today. The main reason why I, my wife and I do what I do uh, is mainly because of, of my mom. She, she uh, was going through her battle with terminal cancer. So all growing up, I was always there uh, with her and taking care of her. And, and again, some of you may understand that more than others, but to be her caretaker was, was such a, a beautiful gift. After my mom had passed away, um, you know, I was again faced with that prayer of keep leading the way and we'll follow. You know, as more time went on, the more my mom's sound of her voice evaporated from my brain. I can only imagine for the, some of these kids and for the, some of these families who are going through these same battles except with, with children. It's like, oh my gosh, it just destroys your heart. And we've met so many wonderful families. And my wife and I, we toured all over the country at top hospitals, bringing this program all over the nation because no one was doing um, what we were doing. And and it totally worked. Well, and then, you know, when, when COVID hit, we totally pivoted everything. You know, we'll meet on Zoom and help patients create. And then we get these virtual reality headsets and we'll send that to them, meet them in virtual reality and premiere their music videos and and what they've created and exposing them to this incredible technology. And then the patient gets to be the expert and teach their families how to use this. And it brings the family together. And it's just like, oh, there's just so much incredible stuff. Just recently, just the other day, you know, we have a patient that we had worked with named Neve. He was a little boy, five years old, and he just passed away from a rare brain cancer called DIPG. Uh, you know, he had limited mobility. So all he could do since his, because the brain tree was lean left and right uh, with his head. So what we did was we wanted to create something cool for him. He, so we ended up making a whole uh, video game on Instagram using that technology to move left and right with his head so he can steer 
uh, the car and we have his voice in the background where you can hear him singing. The highest score uh, secures a $5,000 donation to a specific DIPG um, brain cancer uh, research fund. And Grace Chapel students and their youth group showed up big time. They got like 6,100, I think is the highest score. So they're crushing it. And it was just beautiful to see that a simple thing of using your time and your gift of like playing a video game, playing on, you know, how many of us are on Instagram or Facebook all the time, right? And like, we literally create these Instagram games for patients so that way they can see all these people playing their game and feel like they're not alone. It means so much to the family to know that his light and his legacy and his voice carries on. You know, when I say use your life and your gifts to, to make a positive impact and a difference, you know, some of you say, oh, I don't have gifts, I don't have talents, you know, you're doing all that. But I'm like, no, you, you being here and being alive is literally a huge head start. And that's all you need. Now you just need to hone in your heart and listen to God of, of how he's guiding you to, to, to create something that you don't even know what's possible. Thank you so much for your time. Isn't that so inspiring? You know, James actually has been serving in our student ministry with our high school students for quite some time. And that's how I actually got to meet him and hear his story. And I love how James encourages us to use your life and your gifts to make an impact and a difference in someone's life. It's not asking for you to do something with something that you don't have. But what do you have? What can you use that you have been given to help love others? James to the things that he knew how to do and used it to love these amazing and beautiful kids. And the impact of that simple question, what do I have and how can I use that to love others is tremendous. So in a few moments, I'm going to give us some time to reflect on these two very questions. In what areas has God gifted you? And how can you use that to love others? And how can your family use, that, use those gifts to love others? As you reflect on that question for yourself, maybe this is an opportunity to share with the people that might be in your room or in your life the ways in which you feel like God has gifted that person. And think about how they can use that to love others this year. You know, your story doesn't have to look like James's story. Maybe it does and God is calling you to do something that you don't even know right now. But there's so many ways that you can love others. You can encourage someone, you can spend time with someone, you can give to someone or something. You can think about someone, message uh, someone, pray for someone. You can teach someone. These are all things that we can do daily to love other people. You know, there's this beautiful hymn that really spoke to me when I first heard it. And it's called, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. And the chorus of the song simply says, They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. And something about that line spoke really meaningfully, meaningfully to me when I first heard it, <laughs> because I knew that it didn't really describe the way that I lived my life. I knew that even if my close friends looked into my life, they wouldn't know me for someone who loves others. And if we're being honest, Christians aren't really known for their love for others these days either. But I came to learn that they'll know we are Christians by our love um, derives from a phrase that non-believers used to describe Christian believers of the early church. And they used to describe them this way. Behold how they love one another. Christians in the early days of the church were known for their love for others. And my hope and prayer is that this upcoming year, our love for one another and for others is what describes our lives. That when people see me or you, that they might say, behold, Look how they love one another, how they give their lives for others. And not just so that we can pat ourselves on the back and say, look what we've done, but because we know that this is the love that we've been given from Jesus. So I'm going to give us a time of reflection now to think about how we can love others this year. And then the worship team will lead us in singing that song over our hearts and onto God. And then I'll come back at the end to wrap us up.
I don't know if you've realized this, but this is actually the last Sunday of 2021. What a year, huh? I know as we reflect back to this past year, it was probably a really hard year for a lot of us. We've probably been through a lot of different and difficult situations in this past season of our lives. But as we now look forward to this upcoming year, I hope that we can be people that love others in the ordinary moments. My prayer is that this year would be a year that we wouldn't leave Christmas in our rearview mirrors, but that we would let the story of Christmas help us to love other people in our lives daily. Twas the day after Christmas, when all through the house, all the creatures were loving, even the mouse. Merry Christmas. See you next year. <laughs>